last session, the last part of Ephesians, the AB onwards, the new relationships brought by Christ, the Christian family, and the armor of God, and then simply the conclusion of the letter. The Christian family divided again into two parts, marriage in the church, parents and children, and slaves and masters, only that last part, we have already talked about it, so we will skip that. If you turn your Bibles to Colossians 3.18, as I said earlier, uh, quite likely the letter to the Colossians forms kind of the model after which Ephesians then is modeled and Ephesians kind of an elaboration of Colossians and especially of this part. In verse 18 onwards of Colossians 3, it says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as you should in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be sharp to them. Children, be obedient to your parents always because that is what will please the Lord. Parents, do not irritate your children or they will lose heart. Slaves be obedient in every way to the people who according to human reckoning are your masters and so on all the way till 4.1. It will continue about slaves and masters. Now, you find exactly the same three components, marriage, parents and children, and then slaves and masters. Here very concise in Ephesians, the part that we're going to talk about in a much more elaborate way, especially the part about marriage. The key question to how scholars interpret this passage it has very much to do with where do you place verse 21. Verse 21 says, Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in the New Jerusalem Bible, they had those headings. Most of your Bibles will have headings. The headings are not part of the Bible. Your publisher puts headings over sections so it's easy for you to kind of know what it's about and, and to find back your passage. So the New Jerusalem places this heading, the morals of the home, above verse 21. There may be other Bible translations that will put the heading of this section above verse 22 and leave verse 21 as remaining to the section above it. And that kind of makes a difference because the section before that speaks much more in general terms about the life of Christians and the life of the church. And so it could very well be that this verse is kind of the ending of that last section, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in verse 22, it starts the section about marriage, which starts then with first the instruction to wives and then 25 onwards to husbands. So then it would just say, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. In Greek, verse 20 ends with a comma. And so verse 21 is the continuation of 20. So from that comma, it seems that verse 21 belongs to the section above. But as to its content, it speaks about being subject. We see that word repeated in verse 22. So obviously, it somehow also belongs to this section or could even really be the start of this section. Why is that important? Because if 22 simply was the start and not 21, then why should be subject to the husbands as to the Lord really becomes a commandment on its own, apart from what was said before. Whereas, and later on I will quote quite a few things from Pope John Paul II from his Theology of the Body. He very much sees this as being part of each other. So the first command is we should be subject to each other. And then the second command, when it starts talking to wives, it says you should be subject to your husband. And then when it's talk to husband, it says you should love your wives. Because this line gave rise to a lot of criticism in modern times, this passage very popular at weddings, but then at some time it became very unpopular at weddings because nobody wanted to hear this, wives should be subject to their husbands. It was kind of an outdated section of the Bible. But the way St. John Paul II, in his theology of the sees is that this being subject is not a one-way subject. It is not one under the other, but very much a specification of what is said before that we should be subject to each other first of all. So there is reciprocity of being subject to each other or of the subordination to each other. Of course, this line 21 is not just an introduction to the part of marriage, it is even the introduction of all the three parts in which wives should be subject to their husbands, children should be obedient to their father, and slaves should be obedient to their master. If you think of it, the husband, the father, and the master are simply the same person. In the household, then that would have been the same person. Don't think, therefore, that the husband, the father and the master is the one who has the best place because he also has the high standard because he should then behave. Since they should be subject to him as if to Christ, then also he should behave as Christ. We see that very much in verse 25 onwards, that husbands should love as Christ loves the church, a quite high calling. 
I think quite a beautiful passage, a very rich passage, verse 21 till 33. Maybe I'll just read it first in, in its entirety. Be subject to one another out of reference for Christ. Wives should be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, since as Christ is head of the church and saves the whole body, so is a husband the head of his wife. And as the church is subject to Christ, so should wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands should love their wives just as Christ loves the church and sacrifice himself for her, to make her holy by washing her in cleansing water with a form of words, so that when he took the church to himself, she would be glorious with no speck or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and faultless. In the same way, husbands must love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man to love his wife is for him to love himself. A man never hates his own body, but he feeds it and looks after it. And that is the way Christ treats the church, because we are parts of his body. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and becomes attached to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This mystery has great significance, but I am applying it to Christ and the church. To sum up, you also, each one of you, must love his wife as he loves himself, and let every wife respect her husband. We see here that Paul speaks about two things and interweaves them. He speaks about the Christian marriage, the love of the wife for the husband and the husband for the wife, and he speaks of Christ and the church, and the love of Christ for the church, and the love of the church for Christ and they become a sign of each other. That is simply also why marriage is called a sacrament. A sacrament is always a sign, and therefore it always points to a greater reality. Just as the sacrament of the Eucharist ultimately points forward to the banquet of the Lamb that will happen in heaven. In heaven we find the marriage of the Lamb with His bride, the Church. It's actually interesting because Often when we think of the love of God and the relationship between God and His people, we are very common to think of the image of a father and a child. Of course, that is a very common biblical language. We have become children of God, especially the image of the prodigal son speaks very much to the imagination of what this love of God for His people looks like, like the father that welcomes the returning prodigal son. However, in the Bible, actually, the image of God's love and His relationship to His people is by far more expressed by another image, which is exactly this image, the image of marriage. Actually, the Bible starts with the image of marriage, of the creation of Adam and Eve given to each other to be fruitful and multiply. At the heart of your Bible, you find the Song of Songs. Actually, at times in the monasteries, it was not even allowed to be read because it was supposed to be too erotical a language. But that is very much the language of the love, of the lover for the beloved, the love of God pursuing His bride. Of course, even the prophets speak of this image, even in sometimes a negative sense, like Hosea, who was supposed to marry a prostitute, to kind of show that the people of God, who were supposed to be the bride of God, had given themselves to other God, to other idols, have prostituted themselves away from this union with God. And therefore, the prophet calls them to return to God, come back to me with all your heart. Jesus then brings back this image of marriage, especially in the discourse in Matthew 19 with the Pharisees, we speak about is divorce allowed and he says well only for your hardness of heart Moses allowed you to send a letter of dismissal but it was not intended so from the beginning and so Jesus calls to go back to the original plan of God and go back to the beginning and Jesus then quotes this very same verse that is here quoted in verse 31 that is why a man leaves his father and mother and becomes attached to his wife and the two become one flesh and what God has united, man cannot separate. Going back to the beginning. And it was Pope John Paul II that took this line very serious and made this the object of his study, his moral studies. And even before becoming Pope, he had already made his studies about it, his work, love and responsibility, and then later made into the theology of the body. Then when he became the Pope, he used his material simply now to preach to the whole church because every Wednesday morning the Pope gives catechesis to the whole world. It's called the audience. If you ever go to Rome you on Wednesday morning, I think before Monday you need to get tickets, they are free. You need to have tickets then you can go to the audience. In the audience, the Pope simply gives catechesis to the whole world. And Pope John Paul II, for kind of the first three years of his papacy, decided to just preach about marriage and love, which was this reflection that he started on the call of Jesus to go back to the beginning. To go back to the original plan of God as found in Genesis, the originals. 
Okay, when we think of the originals, most Catholics are only aware of one and we call it original sin. But the original sin is kind of our original rather than God's original. We invented sin. Well, we actually made sin possible because God only created a good world. The original is actually the original before original sin. Man created in the image and likeness of God. In solitude, that relationship with God. He walked with God in the garden. But then God also saw that it was not good for men to be alone. And so he created a helper. Adam fall asleep and from his rib was created then Eve. And the two became one. They were called to this union to be fruitful, to multiply. And then the Bible says they were naked without shame. The original innocence. And of course all of this to some degree was broken or lost with the fall. But God wants to restore that original plan. And if we want to know what marriage really is about, we need to go to this original plan. And that's why the church has always remained unmoved when it comes to its teaching on marriage. Even though many of our separated brethren, the Protestants, they changed their teachings along the way, allowing contraception, allowing divorces in certain cases, allowing remarriage in certain cases because God is ever merciful. But the church holds firm to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of the original plan of God that it was not so meant from the beginning. Marriage is a very high calling. It is actually the only sacrament that in some way actually existed before Jesus came to the world. And marriage was already there. It's just that this natural marriage by Jesus was elevated to the level of sacrament, the original plan of God. And so Pope John Paul II in his Theology of the Body, later they collected all his teachings of the three year, put it into a book. Then many studies have been done about it. It's commonly known as Theology of the Body. Then St. Paul continues his teaching about marriage and especially here in Ephesians we have this beautiful image of the marriage as a sign of the heavenly marriage. And then finally the Bible ends with the image of marriage because the Bible ends with the apocalypse which speaks about heaven and in heaven we see the, the wedding feast of the Lamb. That is what is going to happen in heaven. When we reach heaven we together who are the bride of Christ, we are the church, will marry the bridegroom Jesus himself. He who has pursued us, who has died for us, who has given his life for us in order to purchase us, we will eventually marry him in heaven. Heaven is just going to be one big wedding feast, the wedding banquet. And so, as I said, a sacrament is a sign of a greater reality. When the priest during Mass, before we go for Holy Communion, lifts up the host and says, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. I mean, the supper of the Lamb is really this wedding feast of the Lamb that we see in the Apocalypse. This greater reality. We already on earth celebrate this wedding feast, kind of anticipating that feast that is yet to fully come. And so in the sacrament, we see the already and the not yet. We are already celebrating this wedding feast and it is still to come. The sacrament of the Eucharist points forward to this great reality yet to come. In the same way, the sacrament of marriage points forward to that great reality yet to come. Just as a husband loves his wife and a wife loves his husband exclusively, wholeheartedly, without condition, so Christ loves the church even beyond that. We are a sign to the world of something greater yet to come. That's why marriage is not a private thing. Marriage is not simply something between two persons. When we embark on the vocation of marriage and we take that responsibility given by the church upon ourselves freely, we become a signboard of the church. We become a living signboard that says Christ loves you and the way I'm trying to love my wife, even more Christ loves you and wants to pursue you and marry you. You can understand, therefore, that the force cannot be taken lightly and the church will never say that is okay because divorce simply is saying I no longer want to be a signboard for Christ. It kind of becomes the anti signboard saying that just as I gave up, Christ may also give up on you. And so divorce is a serious thing. Marriage should never be taken lightly. We should continue to fight for our marriage till the very end because that is a faithful witness to the signboard saying that Christ is faithful in his love to you. Now the reason why we need to be subordinate to each other and why wives should be subordinate to their husbands is as to the Lord, since Christ is the head of the church, it says the whole body, so is the husband the head of the wife. And verse 21 says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Christ is the object of our reverence, is the object of our obedience. 
we are subject to each other and we become obedient to each other. It is not so that we place ourselves under another human person, but we place ourselves under another human person so as to be obedient to God Himself. Just as the religious and the priests of the diocese all have the vow of obedience, this is a concrete way they say, well, I'm going to place my obedience under my superior or under the bishop. And he becomes kind of the concrete mouthpiece of God that speaks to me what God wants of me. Not that that excuses us from discerning what God wants in our life. We still need to be prayerful and discerning every day what God wants of us. But ultimately, the priests and the religious are under the obedience of their superior or their bishop. And whenever he says, well, you have to move, you have to go to this parish, you have to go to the mission, they will have to follow in obedience. That ultimately then becomes the will of God. So that the will of God is not something vague, made up by our own imagination, but it also becomes something tangible and concrete. In a sacrament, there is always a tangible element to it. We make this love for God concrete in obedience. And so, like the religious do that in their vow of obedience, in the marriage, this obedience to each other, being subject to each other, also then becomes a concrete way in which we can become obedient to God. As St. John would say, it's easy to say, I love God whom I cannot see, but is that really true if I don't love my brother whom I can see? This is the incarnational part of our faith that this obedience becomes concrete. And this love for God, this reverence for God becomes concrete in the marriage from the husband to the wife and from the wife to the husband. And ultimately, since Christ is really the object of that reverence, the object of that love, it is Him whom we serve when we become subject to each other, then marriage also becomes the expression of God's love. That's why marriage again also is a sign, not only outwards to the world, but also inwards. Because how do I know that God loves me? I can see it in the face of my wife who loves me. And how can my wife know that God loves her? Hopefully I can be the mirror of God's love to her. That is our calling. Of course we will do it in an imperfect way, but that is kind of the standard that we should live up. The calling of marriage is to reflect God's love to each other and to love God in loving the other. The spiritual measurement of how much I really love God can be measured in the measurement of how much do I love my spouse. If I only love my spouse half-heartedly, then I cannot love God wholeheartedly. The measure of how much I love God is also the measure of how much I love my spouse. Of course, this then also starts to reflect to the fruit of marriage, which is children. Once offspring comes and children come, then as parents, we too have this calling of reflecting God's love to our children. And again, we do that in an imperfect way, but we have to strive for that. So, I read a bit longer part from the Theology of the Body, chapter 89. The opening expression of the passage of Ephesians 5, 21, 33, which we have approached by the analysis of a remote and immediate context, has quite a special eloquence. The author speaks of mutual subjection of the spouses. So St. John Paul II stresses that this subjection of the spouses is mutual. In saying this, the author does not intend to say that the husband is the lord of his wife or that the interpersonal pact proper to marriage is a pact of dominion of the husband over the wife. So marriage must not be misunderstood as maybe it was misunderstood in the time of St. Paul to be a contract, to be a dominion of the husband over the wife. It is quite the contrary. Instead, he expresses a different concept. That is, the wife can and should find in her relationship with Christ the motivation of the relationship with her husband. Loving Christ is the starting point. And when we love Christ wholeheartedly, then we also wholeheartedly want to love our spouse and be subject to our spouse. Since this union of marriage is a union of love, he continues, love excludes every kind of subjection whereby the wife may become a servant or a slave of the husband, an object for unilateral dominion. Love makes the husband simultaneously subject to the wife and thereby subject to the Lord himself, just as the wife to the husband. The communion or unity which they should establish through marriage is constituted by a reciprocal donation of self, and by a true gift of self out of reverence for Christ. So the calling to be subject is actually a calling to give of yourself. And marriage is nothing else than making a true gift of yourself. It's not about saying loving words or giving part of your time. It is about giving your entire self, the total gift of self in which we find ourselves. 
I think that these challenging verses, or as at least modern culture may seem it challenging, to say to the wife that they should be subject to the husbands, I think also calls to mind the story of Genesis, the story of creation. There's actually two stories of creation, but in the second story of creation, we find that Adam is created first, and Adam is alone. And uh, he is named by the Hebrew word for man, which is Adama. So Adam simply means man. But man not in the male type, but man simply in being human. So he is the first human called Adama, Adam. This is the only time in the creation story that God doesn't say, and God saw it was good, but he saw it was not good. And what was not good is that Adam is alone. That humankind is alone. And so he wants to find him a suitable helper. So he gives him permission to name all the animals. So Adam starts this process of naming all the animals over whom he is Lord. But at the end, when he ends this whole process of naming all the animals, he finds no suitable companion. Because the animal is of a different nature. He's of a different kind than himself. There is not that intimate connection. And then God says, well, then I'll put you into a deep sleep and I'll take out the rib. And from that rib, I will create a new person. And so when he awakes, Adam falls in love. This is actually the most beautiful passage in scripture that speaks of really what falling in love means in its most pure and authentic form, not the Hollywood form, but the authentic form of falling in love. When Adam awakes from his sleep and he opens his eyes, I think he must have blinked a few times because he saw this beautiful woman, at last flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Whoa, man. That's why uh, she shall be called woman. Right? He fell in love. And so, in Hebrew, actually, the words now change. It no longer speaks of Adam, meaning man in terms of human, but now it changes to a word called Ish. Ish being male. And the woman is called Isha, because she is taken from Ish. Now, here we see that the one human has become two forms, male and female. Both created in the image and likeness of God. Both an expression of the image and likeness of God. We are given intelligence, we can make free choices to love, and that way we reflect what is unique to God. Two stories expressing the same reality. One in which male and female is created simply at the same time. One where the female is created from the rib of Adam. Of course, these are two the same realities, but highlighting a different aspect. In the second story, what wants to be highlighted is the complementarity of humans. Because then it ends with the call that we also find in verse 31, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and becomes attached to his wife, and the two become one flesh. The call to one flesh union. So we are made for each other. Basically, you look at the human body, the human body actually on its own doesn't make sense. But in light of marriage, on our wedding night, when we appear before each other naked without shame, our body starts to make sense. The male body makes sense in light of the female body. The female body makes sense in the light of the male body. They are made to be complementary. And that's why their union and love then also becomes fruitful. Which then, of course, makes the church's stance on homosexuality understandable. Because this very image in which God has created us, this complementarity, is entirely lost in the homosexual expression. And therefore, not fruitful. God created Adam from the rib. There is this quote which is very much in line with what the theological body teaches. The woman was made from the rib of Adam and not made from his head so as to rule over him, not made from his feet so as to be trampled upon, but out of his sight so that they are equal, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be loved. So this made from the rib is really a beautiful image. Not above, not below, but equal. To be loved close to the heart and that's why his heart goes out to her. In the Genesis story, again, the sensitivity of the language is often seen in the word helper. God wanted to make a helper for Adam, and so again, is then the wife simply the helper of the husband? Just as here, is, is she just the subject to the husband? Again, Pope John Paul II, in his theology of the body, he says that the concept of help also expresses this reciprocity of existence. I'm going to make him a help implies that he too will be a help to her. This is not in the sense that Adam needed a mate. Adam needed somebody like him to help him on his journey, just as he would be to her the help on her journey, which ultimately is the journey to God. Ultimately, the calling of marriage 
is the calling to get each other into heaven, to make each other holy, to help each other to love God wholeheartedly. And later on, chapter 6, when we talk about parents and children, is exactly the same. The calling of us parents is the calling to get our children into heaven, to help them to establish that love relationship with God. The hell which is derived in a sense from the very fact of existing as a person beside a person. A hell in the sense of somebody that stands beside you. And that is what marriage is all about, to stand by each other's side. Verses 22 till 24 can really only be understood in the context of verse 21 in which we are called to be subject to each other. It can also only be really understood if we understand the calling of the husband. Because if we stop at verse 24, it sounds kind of challenging, crude. But if we actually know the calling of the husband, then actually to be subject to your husband isn't such a bad thing. Because what is the calling of the husband? The calling of the husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. I think the calling to be subject seems to be easier than the calling to love as Christ loves. Because how does Christ love? He gives his entire life. He died. He gave his life. He sacrificed himself entirely away. That is the calling of the husband. To sacrifice of himself, to give himself away for his wife, ultimately also for his children. This sacrificial love is the love to which we are called. John Paul II reflects on this. He says, the husband is above all he who loves, and the wife, on the other hand, is the one who is loved. One could even hazard the idea that the wife's submission to her husband, understood in the context of the entire passage of the letter, signifies above all the experience of love. Subject to your husband means to be the receiver of his love, to be under the one who sacrifices himself for you. You see, it's very important that we know who we follow. If we have a crude image of God, surely we will not want to follow Him wholeheartedly. If we don't know that He is a really a loving God who has the best for us in mind, we wouldn't want to be subject to Him either. In the same way to our husband, why would I want to be subject to my husband unless I know that He loves me? This subject in that sense is also limited to the effect of how much the husband really loves the wife. If the husband feels his obligation to be self-sacrificing and loving as Christ loves and becomes the ruler and dominator or even the abuser, then of course we don't need to be subject to that abuse. And we have all the right to protect ourselves from any form of abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual. The husband is then the head of his wife just as Christ is the head of the church. Now the head of the church here in this context doesn't speak about lordship. He doesn't say Christ, the head of the body, who is the Lord, the one who makes all the rules. It speaks here of Christ as the head of the church, the one who saves the body. So the idea of the head of the body in this passage speaks about Christ as the Savior. And so when it then transfers that image of Christ being the head of the church to the husband being the head of the wife, or even the head of the household, it must be understood in this concept of being Savior rather than being Lord. It perpetuates this call to sacrificing love and to help each other achieve heaven. Of course, the first truth is that Christ is the head of the church. That is the ultimate reality that Paul is speaking about. But in the same way, the husband should be head of his wife or of the household to save the household, to save his wife, to bring them to Christ and to sacrifice of himself. So redeeming love here is transformed, I would say, into spousal love. Here, the Savior becomes the bridegroom who pursues his bride. In verse 28, the focus changes now to the idea of not so much loving as Christ loved, but loving since you love yourself. A man must love his wife as he loves his own body. For a man to love his wife is to love himself. A man never hates his own body, but he feeds it, he looks after it. And that is the way Christ treats the church. We should love as we love ourselves. And then in verse 31 it says, the two become one flesh. So we see that same image here in the weave. This idea of the two becoming one and the husband loving his wife as he loves himself. So also again the idea of one. I love as I love myself. As if that is the same person because the two are one. Of course, when Paul says the two become one, doesn't mean we cease to be one person. Me and my wife are still two persons. 
I am one person and she is one person. There is still, of course, a bisubjectivity and there's still two persons, but they are one, not in the sense of being, but in the sense of morality. We are called to be one. We are called to love as one, to be totally united and to act as one. It also says that the love of Christ for the church has essentially her sanctification as its scope. In verse 27, he gives himself up for her in order to cleanse her, in order to make her glorious without speck or wrinkle, but holy and faultless. To make each other holy. And again, that is the calling of marriage, to make each other holy. That's why I often try to be difficult to my wife so that she can become holy. <laughs> No, no, that's not the way, but, but in some sense, actually, that is true. It is by the fact that we irritate each other and make it difficult for each other. Not intentionally, of course, but that is a part of sharpening each other. If everything was smooth, we would remain as selfish as ever before. It is the very fact that sometimes it is hard and challenging that we are also sharpened to become more loving. So Christ washes her and makes her holy. Now this washing... In verse 26 says, a washing her in cleansing of water with a form of words. Of course, this is an image of baptism. He washes her, even though, of course, every person is baptized one by one. But every time that one person is baptized, that this is how John Paul II sees it, the spouse of of Christ is applied to her, the church, every time that a single person receives in her the fundamental purification by means of baptism. Every time one person is baptized, the whole church is purified by it. Whoever receives baptism becomes by virtue of the redemptive love of Christ at the same time a participant in the spousal love of the church. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the church. We become part of this union of the bridegroom Christ with his bride, the church. We become part of that spousal union. Some scholars see in this text the washing, an ancient ritual in which the bride was washed before entering into marriage to be made holy. In verse 28 onwards, when we see that the husband must love his wife as he loves himself, we see in here what Pope John Paul II calls the personalistic norm. If you're familiar with the theology of the body, it speaks very much against utilitarianism and it speaks for the personalistic norm. Utilitarianism is simply a fancy word for saying using each other, to make each other a utility. Every person has an innate dignity and can never be treated as an object for somebody else. If I make the other in an object, then in the context of sexuality, we call that word lust. When I lust after someone, I make that person an object for my own gratification. Pope John Paul II actually made this very challenging because prior to his teaching, most theologians would say that lust can only happen from somebody to somebody that is not his wife or her husband. But Pope John Paul II actually challenged the church and said, well, actually, it's even possible for the husband to lust after his wife or the wife to lust after her husband. Lust can even happen within marriage, in which we simply make each other an object for my own gratification and sexual intimacy is simply for what I get out of it. I don't care whether you enjoy it. I don't care about you. I just want what I want. And that is a very dangerous place to be in because that sexual union should be an expression of love. It should not be an expression of taking, but an expression of giving. I want to have intercourse with my wife because I want to make a gift of myself to her, for her sakes, just as much as she makes a gift of herself to me for my sake. And we do that both for the sake of the union. The sexuality is an expression of that union of love and of course always open to the fruitfulness of that union, which is the openness to children. The personalistic norm, all of us, we are created in the image and likeness of God and therefore we have innate dignity and therefore we should be treated always as a subject, as a person, never as an object to be used but as someone to be loved. What this personalistic norm entails is very much what the Golden Rule tells us. The Golden Rule that we find in both the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, what you do not want to be done to you, do not do unto others. The negative version, do not do unto others what you don't want to be done unto you. Jesus formulates it in the positive way, says, do unto others what you want done unto you. Both, of course, apply in the same way. In other words, what I want, do that to others. Or what I don't want, do not do. So the personalistic norm can be applied by simply seeing the other person as another me, as another I. Especially in marriage, in a very deep way, we become that other I. 
Love makes the other eye, in a certain sense, one's own eye. Through love, the wife's eye becomes, so to speak, the husband's eye. The body is the expression of this eye. It's the basis of its identity. To see the other as another me. And of course, this even goes beyond marriage. And I think if you really want to change the world and, and live the social teaching of the church, it should start by seeing every human person as another me. Because it will really change the way we treat the poor, we treat the marginalized, we treat the sick. If I can see in the other another me, well, for myself, I want the best. For myself, I want to be treated with dignity. I want to be given the help so that I can be healthy, so that I can live. Do I wish that for every other person? Or is every other person simply kind of like an object in a far distance that I rather don't want to look so closely at because it becomes uncomfortable? There is the way we protect ourselves. Of course, also understandable because I can't save the whole world. But the principle must be every other person is another me. And therefore, it deserves to be treated simply the same way as I. My domestic helper deserves the same treatment as I want to be treated. There are no second class citizens in the Christian worldview. Everybody should be another I. The man never hates his own body, verse 29, but he feeds it. Scholars have often seen in this an image of the Eucharist. Christ feeds his own body with the Eucharist in order to nourish it. Verse 32 speaks of this mystery has great significance. Now Paul comes to his conclusion. And I think that his conclusion also comes from his personal lifestyle because Paul was a celibate. Most of the early apostles, I think except John, were all married men. But the apostle Paul, on the contrary, was a celibate, which was quite uncommon in that time because most rabbis would have been married persons. But St. Paul decided to live a celibate lifestyle for the sake of the King of God because of his mission. And so when he here says, but I am applying it to Christ and the church, he also sees it from the celibate perspective of being wholeheartedly devoted to Christ, just as the religious sisters, and sometimes when they take their vinyl vow, they dress up like brides because they become the bride of Christ. Or the priest, when he becomes ordained, he takes the vow of celibacy. He, in the person of Christ, marries the church. The church becomes also his bride. So Paul sees it in that reality. Also that marriage and celibacy both point to that greater reality, the wedding feast of the Lamb, still to come, where Christ marries his bride. And that is the greater reality. That is the true reality. That is what it is really about, the union of Christ with his church. And so that is where the emphasis lies. He calls this a great mystery history with great significance. From the 3rd century onwards, in the Latin translation of the Greek text, this word mysterium, mystery, became translated with the word sacramentum. So in Latin, it doesn't say this mystery, but rather this sacrament has great significance. Here, it already makes that link between the mystery, what Paul is speaking about, and that being a sacrament. Of course, Paul, at the moment that he wrote this, didn't intend to write his sacrament. He writes a mystery. He doesn't explicitly hear talks about the sacrament, but in a very implicit sense, in a very obvious sense, this is really what the sacrament is all about. This is kind of the blueprint of what marriage is as a sacrament. The way we interpret the word mystery and the way we understand sacrament evolves in the church. Only in the third century, this word is starting to be seen as meaning a sacrament. St. Augustine, making use of various meanings of the term sacraments, applies it to the religious rite, both of the Old and the New Covenant, to biblical symbols and vicars, as well as to the revealed Christian religion. All these sacraments, according to St. Augustine, pertain to the great sacrament, the mystery of Christ and the Church. St. Augustine influenced the further clarification of the term sacrament, emphasizing that the sacraments are sacred signs, that they contain in themselves a resemblance to what they signify, and that they confer what they signify. By his analysis, he therefore contributes to the elaboration of a concise collective definition of the sacrament, signum e facit gracie, meaning a sign that gives grace. I think most of you will be used to the definition of a sacrament being a visible sign that conveys an invisible grace and then instituted by Christ. It is a visible sign that conveys an invisible reality, but also that a sacrament does what it says that it does. When the priest says, I baptize you, you are baptized. When the priest says, this is my body, it becomes the body, it is the body. It conveys what it says it conveys. When we go for Holy Communion, it says the body of Christ, that is exactly what we receive. That is also what we become. We become what we receive. Exactly what it says that it conveys, it conveys. 
in the sacrament of baptism, which was spoken about in verse 26, the sign is that we are baptized in the water, we die with Christ, we rise with Christ, and that's exactly what happens to us. Every sacrament therefore also has a matter and a form. The matter is a tangible reality, the form is a formula, words, and that is also what it is here. Making her holy by washing her in cleansing water, water is the matter, with a form of words, the form, I baptize you. Just as in the sacrament of the Eucharist, bread and wine is the matter, this is my body, this is my blood, is the form. So what in the sacrament of marriage is the matter? What is the tangible part of marriage? Children? I mean, that's quite tangible, but it's not, not the answer that, that, that I'm looking for. What is the tangible sign of the sacrament of marriage? It should be quite simple. The ring, okay, I, I heard that one before, but it's not the ring either. The ring is, is a symbol of that sign there, yeah, but, okay. The church? The husband and wife, exactly. The husband and wife are the, are the tangible matter of the sacrament. If you're married, you are the tangible sign of the sacrament together with your spouse. We are the tangible sign to each other, we are the matter. And what is the form? What is the words that convey marriage? The vows. And therefore, the sacrament of marriage is the only sacrament that is not conveyed by the priest to the one who get married. The other sacraments are usually the priest that conveys a sacrament to the one who receives it. But marriage is the sacrament that the couple gives to each other. And the priest is the witness of it, which blesses it, but ultimately it's the couple itself that administers the sacrament to each other and then consumes that sacrament in the wedding bed. Then the Second Vatican Council returns above all to the original sacraments of sacrament mysterium, calling the church the universal sacrament of salvation. We often know sacraments to be seven, the seven sacraments of the church. The Vatican Council reflected on the church and says, well, actually, the church itself is like a sacrament. It too is a visible sign, it's a physical reality that conveys an invisible grace that helps us to become part of the mystery of God. And it is within this great sacrament, this universal sacrament of salvation, the church, that the seven sacraments then are administered. Moving on to chapter 6, still in the same section now, it goes to the relationship of parents-children. Children should be obedient to their parent. They should be subject to their parent, they should listen to their parent. As an argument, he will use one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, that comes with a promise. It's the only commandment of the Ten Commandments that comes with a promise, and that if you honor your father and mother, then you may have long life and prosper in the land. Of course, this is a spiritual reality, a reality that we may live in this relationship with God, the land being the promised land, being the land of freedom, that we may live in freedom, that we may live in that relationship with God. Verse 4, very important to all of us and his parents, never drive your children to resentment, but bring them up with correction and advice inspired by the Lord. How to do that will take uh, 10 weeks, and I'm not the expert, so uh, I cannot tell you how to do that. I'm still trying to learn it myself. Uh, but uh, it's the call that we try to live up to. Not to connect them to death, not to make them angry or resentful. Of course, with correction, it's not that unconditional love means we let them do whatever they want. That is not love. That is treating them as masters. That is treating them as if they were not children. But if they are our children, then we want them also to learn the right ways because we know that living the right way, learning to do the right thing brings freedom. Freedom is not to do what you like, but freedom is an ability to do the good thing that you're called to do. And so when we train them to do good, we train them in an ability to do that good, to choose that good, which enables them to be free and therefore happy. But the ultimate call that we are called to is to help them encounter the Lord with correction and advice inspired by the Lord because ultimately this relationship with Christ, this relationship with Jesus is what it is all about. To help my children encounter God, to help my children know God. So no resentment. And resentment I think comes from mere rules. Rules for the sake of rules, without guidance, rather than giving them correction and advice. To help them understand the reason behind rules so that they can live it out of a free choice and not blindly following rules. The Catechism then recalls to us from here that we have the first responsibility to educate our children of creating a home where tenderness, forgiveness, respect, fidelity and disinterested service are the rule. 
the home, the domestic church, should be the place where we are schooled in the virtues of our faith. Is an apprenticeship in self-denial, sound judgment, and self-mastery, all preconditions to true freedom. And in the end, we are called not just to educate them, but to help them encounter God. And we do that by example. Verse 5 to 9 speaks about slaves and how they need to be obedient to their masters, but also how masters need to treat their employees well, knowing that all of us have the same master in heaven who has no favoritism. And in the end, these three passages, marriage, parenthood, and slave masters, all spoke about obedience. But the conclusion is the end. Never to forget that in the end, we are all subject to somebody else. We all serve the same master who treats us equally, and he is Jesus the Lord. And so we can only lead others in as much as we are obedient to our heavenly master, else we are leading people astray. Then the last section speaks about the spiritual warfare and to put on the armor of God. Paul reminds us that our ultimate battle is not against humans, against things that we can see, but our ultimate fight is against spiritual principalities and ruling forces in the dark world, the spirits of evil in the heavens. So the real fight that goes on in our life is the fight against evil at many different levels. I think different churches, and especially Protestant churches, different ways of, of the way they speak about the devils. There are some that overdo it and see the devil everywhere, giving him credit for everything he does, and I think that the devil is probably laughing about it because he had no involvement, but he still gets the credit. <laughs> And there are other churches and also parts of the Catholic Church, I mean, not the official Catholic teaching, but people in the church that think that the devil is nowhere to be found, or even that he doesn't exist. And I think that the devil has really won when he gets people to convince that he doesn't exist. So we need to have a balanced view. Don't give him credit for what he didn't do, but do take his reality serious. He is a force to be reckoned with. Now, compared to us, if it was to our human capacity, as a spirit, he may be stronger than us, but we also must know and stand in the victory of Christ because Christ has already won the victory. And so in him, being born again as children of God, we too share in the victory of Christ over darkness. And so that this darkness and the ruling forces have no chance against us. As long as we remain in Christ, and therefore we are called to put on this spiritual armor. Again, I added a few numbers from the Catechism that speak about the fall of the angels because that is what this is about. God did not create evil, He did also not create evil spirits, but there were angels that also have a free choice. Angels make one and eternal choice, and when they make that one and eternal choice, that becomes eternal. So they either choose to serve God, they are the good angels, or they choose with the devil, the first one to fall against God, and forever they are enemies of God, forever they are damned. And so it is against them that we fight. And as 395 says, the power of Satan nonetheless is not infinite. He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, but still a creature. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign because Christ is ultimately superior and we stand in his victory. So on our own we will not win, but with God we will win. Drawing from Isaiah 11, 59 and Wisdom 5, St. Paul here speaks about some of the weaponry that we can use. First of all, the girdle of truth, the belt of truth, to stand in the truth. We need to stand your ground with the truth as belt around your waist, to be consecrated in truth, as Jesus prayed in John 17 or John 4. The true worshippers that the Father seeks is those that worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is only in truth that we can really serve God. When we start following lies, for surely we are not serving God and we become open to the attacks of the enemy. Uprightness, righteousness as a breastplate. And this is of course a righteousness that we receive from God who has made us righteous through His work of salvation. Always carry the shield of faith so that you can quench the burning arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith to walk in faith, a faith that can move mountains. To hold to that relationship with God, when we hold to that relationship, we are in a safe place. Therefore, you must take salvation as your helmet. We walk in the salvation of Christ that He has won for us. Then verse 17, all other of the tools that He speaks about, the imagery He uses according to the Roman armor, are all kind of defense mechanisms. The only weapon kind of attack is the sword. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But the Word of God, of course, always first and foremost is Jesus Himself. He is the Word of God. And He became incarnate. So He is our sword. He is the one that wins us the victory. 
The Word of God also, of course, comes to us just through the Bible, which we call the Word of God. Hebrews 4 says, The Word of God is something alive and active. It cuts more incisively than any two-edged sword. It can seek out the place where soul is divided from spirit or joints from marrow. It can pass judgments on secret emotions and thoughts. No created thing is hidden from Him. Everything is uncovered and stretched fully open to the eyes of the one to whom we must give an account of ourselves. So the same image that is used in Hebrews, the image of the Word of God as a sword, alive and active, able to cut through to where it really happens, the point of joint and marrows, to understand. Often it's the sword that really pierces our own heart. It's the Word of God that God uses as an operation knife to cut out things that are not of Him and to insert things that are of Him. This of course also reminds us of the temptations of Jesus in the desert as found in Luke 4, also in the Gospel of Matthew, where we see how this works. It's very interesting because when the devil tries to tempt Jesus, he uses scripture. So even the devil can use scripture, which is kind of a dangerous thing because that means that the Word of God can even be used against God if misappropriated, misinterpreted. And so we too actually even can deceive ourselves when we don't align our understanding of scripture with the teachings of the church. But Jesus then uses the Word of God as a sword to fend off the devil. He gives him back the scriptures to say that God alone must be served. And so in the end then the devil needs to give up. That is how Jesus also uses this sword of the Spirit. Verse 18 onwards, this passage ends with a call to continue to pray, to persevere in prayer, and especially as we also saw in the other letters, pray so that I can bear witness of the Gospel so that I may speak fearlessly something that I think we need to pray for as well. Then the last four verses of the book simply are the concluding part, which are almost word for word the same as Colossians. And it ends with, May God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grant you peace, love, faith to all the brothers. May the grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ in life, imperishable. Grace is the beginning and the end of Christian experience, and it is our only hope for immortality, for life everlasting. Conclusion from here, the sacrament of marriage is a sign of a deeper reality, the wedding of the Lamb, the marriage of Christ, the bridegroom, with the church, the bride. In marriage, subordination, being subject to each other is mutual. This subordination is about receiving the gift of love. Husbands have the high and difficult calling to sacrificially love like Christ did. And then to parents, parents should not provoke their children to resentment, but help them to build a relationship with Jesus. And the real battle in life is against spiritual powers and therefore we need to put on the armor of God to protect us. So let's conclude with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Holy Father, we thank you for this week's of Bible study, for entering deeper into your word, for allowing your word like a sword to pierce our heart. We thank you especially for those passages, those verses, those words that really struck a chord with us, that really touched us, that really spoke to us. Lord, may we not put it aside, but let us act upon it. Let us cherish that word. Let us continue to reflect on that word so that that word may grow in our lives and bear fruit and may change us. We especially pray for your blessing upon all of us who are married. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon our marriages. Lord, we may we truly live this high calling to reflect your love to each other, to receive your love through each other, and to show your love to our children. We continue to protect us with your armor, with faith and salvation, with love, with your word. Lord, that we may always walk in your victory that you have won for us. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.